This is the module J um, lecture video, scheduling and programming architecture is what we're going to study. The activities were to go on D2L and download the PowerPoint so that you could uh, then click on this lecture video. I've got three times uh, in here where you're going to have to stop and watch other links to other videos. Fill out the lecture worksheet and then turn that in. Our outcomes for this week are describe the difference between tasks, programs, and routines. Give examples of periodic tasks. Explain the difference between local and global tags. Explain how the retentive nature of subroutines can create problems. We're going to start with our ladder logic uh, review from last week. We did functions and function blocks are similar to subroutines. And we uh, scheduled a variety of different functions and function blocks, some with memory and some without. Um, they needed to be scheduled in order to be scanned. Um, it's a way to organize code, so these functions and function blocks could be um, programmed with ladder logic or an FBD. We did a little bit of both and then we scheduled them and that was kind of a way to organize our code. Um, functions and function blocks are a way to reuse code. So we did a motor starting application where if we were starting uh, motors we could just take that um, function block or that subroutine that we created and then we could just schedule it over and over and over again and just give it an, a different output uh, motor 1, motor 2, motor 3 and uh, we would be good to go. So it's a way to use, reuse code. Um, the subroutines can be conditionally or unconditionally scheduled. We'll look at a couple different ways there of, of it. A lot of times subroutines are just unconditionally scheduled. They just automatically run. They're just uh, generated to um, organize your code. Sometimes it's useful to interlock these so that um, you don't, you're not calling uh, one or both at the same time you would be calling one or the other okay and we'll look at this again um, if that would be good if an output is used more than once I don't recommend using an output more than once we'll look at some options to not use the output more than once you can though you just have to be very careful with what you're doing um, it's better to use internal bits instead of using an output twice we'll take a look at that again um, sometimes it's helpful to keep outputs in the main OB but not necessarily you don't necessarily need to do that so typically if you look at modern scheduling if you look into the main all you're going to see is the calling of subroutines there wouldn't be any outputs in there but if your operation your PLC operation was the main purpose was to start an output maybe you would put that output into the main but a lot of times there'd be nothing in the main except for subroutines so for our run jog examples um, there was a variety that we'll be looking at um, so we had our e-stop uh, in our program was wired for a not. I just want to rem remind you that you don't need to put a not on your e-stop because the e-stop e is wired normally closed. If the e-stop was wired normally open then you might use a not but that's really not the correct application of it. You would wire the e-stop normally closed and, and then you wouldn't need a not. And then a toggle switch is a single output or is it multiple outputs? Well, our toggle switches are has a, a single common pole and can switch between input one or input two, but we were using the toggle switch as a single input. So the toggle switch would either be true or false, you know, on a single input. So let's take a look at the first example of our run jog. Will this work? Okay, so what we have here is that toggle switch that I was just talking about. So we're either going to be run or we're going to be jog because we're using it as a single um, as a single one here, single input. So either this is going this is scheduled so that either this function is going to run or this function is going to run. Both of them are not going to run. This one or this one. So that's one way to schedule it. Okay. So what we have is in the jog, that's the jog subroutine if for some reason the toggle calls that you push the start button and the motor comes on. Okay, and then in this in the run we have um, our holding circuit here. So a couple things about this: we've used the output twice. And that's not necessarily a good idea, but the way that this is scheduled, because we can either only run this one or this one, 
then we put the motor into this subroutine and we put the motor into this subroutine and so therefore it's either going to run here or run here you could get in trouble with some retentive nature of these subroutines um, but it looks like this would work a couple of other things it is okay to use PLC tags in a subroutine so when I look into this subroutine I see that I've used the start which has an address on it which means it's a PLC tag when I look into this subroutine I see start the same start these these are the same so if these both were scheduled when I push the start you'd be seeing inputs coming on and the outputs responding accordingly okay it's alright to use PLC tags in a subroutine um, that's fine but we didn't necessarily do that what we did is we wrote um, subroutines here and we used local tags so here's the example of a local tag that goes into this subroutine and here's the example of the local tab that goes into this subroutine okay and so now remember on these local tags I have a start here and I have a start here but because these are local tags this subroutine doesn't uh, understand this subroutine at all so these are two dis different tags and so if this one's true that doesn't mean that this one is true in the previous example we use global tags so that if this one was true this one would also be true if they were both scheduled same with the motor here we did an output twice but really this motor output is only for this subroutine and this motor is only for this subroutine they don't see what each other is doing okay so in this case what we did is is a little bit different we use local tags so they got generated here in the function block or the function here's our local tags okay and then what I did is I used the toggle switch to schedule the function block so look at the run jog once again is used for scheduling so either this one or this one is going to run you, you can't have both of them running at the same time because the toggle either selects and schedules one or the other okay so what we did different this time is that if I hit start you know all these things here would be true and the jog bit would come on or if I scheduled this one and I hit start then I would get memory and then the run bit would come on so instead of d turning on a motor here I took this bit or this bit and I turned on the motor so I ended up using the motor only once that's the true out output the motor the field device I only it's only in the program once it makes it easier to troubleshoot this logic right here is in the main you know all this, these logics here are in the subroutines and they get scheduled by the toggle so that way I only have the motor once so I can come here and I can look to see if the motors on or off that's different than what we did before on the last one because we used the output twice and it could be more difficult for troubleshooting to, to figure out hey is the motor on or is it off depends on where you're looking here there's only use once it's going to be obvious whether the PLC is telling us to turn on or turn off um, the next one we did here <laughs> is we took a run jog and what I did is I took the routines and I just unconditionally scheduled them see this right here this EN is true this EN is true so both of these are scheduled they're both of these subroutines are being called and they're both running okay that was different last time we used the um, something right here to either schedule them or to not schedule them we use the run jog to either schedule this one or to schedule this one okay notice we still have the run jog wired in here so that it's we're only we're gonna get this choice of true here and false here or false here and true here it's not going to be both it can only be one or the other but we'll use that later the difference once again is that these are automatically running so this code right here is automatically running and this code right here is automatically running so you think okay why wouldn't they both automatically run then you know when I hit the start because assuming that the stop was true and the safeties were true the stop and the safeties of the overloads or whatever assuming these were true because we hadn't hit them you know how come when I hit the start I don't get a motor here and a motor here I get a jog bit and a run bit both coming true well the reason is is because I have the choice here and the choice is the run jog so if 
this contact right here is zero. If this contact right here is zero, then that means that this one's zero also. Okay? So zero here returns a false. So at choice right here, I, I'm false. I got a zero. So this rung right here is false. So it doesn't matter if I schedule it or not. It's false. But now let's look at the other sub. So once again, if this is false. So if this has got a zero in here, just like I had a zero in there, well then this time it's true. If I put a zero in a closed contact, it's true. So my choice here is true. And then I get true here. So that even though both of these are scheduled at the same time, this choice is false, this choice is true. So when I hit the start button, I get the motor, I get the run bit. And I did the same thing where I put either the run bit or the jog bit. Here's the jog bit and the run bit. And, and, and or, either one of those will turn on the motor. I've only used the motor once, and therefore it's easy to troubleshoot. So this was a nice way, um, if you're on a lab, to put the run jog in here. Or some people might have did it with a direction. It just depends. To make only one of the rungs in your function block true if you decided to unconditionally schedule them. But you could have conditionally scheduled them. So there's different ways to do it. So once again, uh, functions don't, do not have memory. FBs have memory and a data box block is created. So once you create your function block and you got it, it's, it's cool and you have all your inputs and it's working good, remember you just can't copy the function block. You need to schedule it. You need to add the block because a data block will be created with it. So we did FC and FB can have local internal tags. They're not really associated with a contact, a bit, or a coil, and you can reuse them a lot, right? Global tags are associated with a contact, a bit, or a coil. And you can, for example, you have a glo global tag called push button one. Well, you can use that as many times as you want in the program. But what that's saying is physically in the real world connected to the PLC, there really is only one push button. And so when you push that button, if you use these tags in the program, all the contacts associated that with that will close. Okay, It's okay to use that for an input, but if you're using for a bit or a coil, best practice is to maybe only use those outputs once in the program for troubleshooting. So global tags can be used inside, it can be used in the OB, the main, that obviously makes sense. Global tags can be used in the functions and the functions box. And so if the functions in the subroutines get scheduled, well then they'll get scanned and the global tags will get scanned and, and the global outputs will be updated and turned on. So you can use global tags in the subroutines. Nothing wrong with that. Local tags cannot be used in the main. So the local tags, the opposite is of that. The local tags, they can only be used in the subroutines. You can't take the local tag and then move it out into the main OB. Okay? They're, they're strictly for the subroutines. <laughs> Here was um, the tag assignment for this. Um, when we scheduled our motor control, the local tags were shown inside of here. These were all the things that we had to have true. Okay, And then we associated the global tags with this. For example, the run jog switch. We put the run jog toggle there. The forward reverse switch. We put that with that. The run push button. So we associated these global tags with, the, with our local tags. In this case, motor control. Okay, Same with the output here. So let's just um, take a look at the solution. And a lot of people made it, you know, you make this um, very complicated, but let's just think about our run jog circuit. Here's the run jog circuit that you did in 131. You had um, a selector switch here. So if the selector switch was open and you hit the start, then you got the motor to run. But because this jog was open, the memory. Um, parallel rung was going to be false because we were open here. So it didn't matter if the, if the auxiliary came on or not. It was prohibited from latching on. If you close the jog switch here to, to run, 
Well, then when you hit start, you'd have the memory, uh, the path for memory here through the jog that's now closed to run, and you would get memory. So that was the first jogging circuit that you did in 131. And basically, if you take this and you make it into code here, you got the same thing, auxiliary contacts, run, jog, run, and motor. So this is just the version of it, that this run, jog switch is either going to be true or false. And so if it's false, you get a jog mode. If it's true, you get a run mode. So that was the run jog basic circuit. And so if we just take our run jog, it's right here, run, aux, jog, either true or false, and motor. This was just our basic circuit here. Now, we threw some extras on here to make the function block look, look like it had a lot going on. So we threw an electrical interlock on there, which we did in 131. That would, that would be something that electrical interlocks are wired normally closed. So this would be returning true. We put an overload on there. So once again, the overloads are usually closed. So this would be returning true. We said the MCR had to be on. And so the MCR is on. This would be returning true. Safety systems, we had an e-stop wired in. E-stops are wired closed. So this would be true. And then we had a forward reverse switch. So depending on the direction of the forward or reverse, this would either be true or false. So basically we've got something coming here where, where it looks like all of this, if we hit the start button, is going to either be true, but it won't execute depending on whether we've made the forward or reverse switch true or false, similar to what we showed before. Okay, so here we go again. You took this motor control function block and you scheduled it twice so that you would get two data blocks. Take, so you generated this with all your tags and all your ladder logic we'll look at and you, and you schedule it twice. The first time you schedule the forward starter, the second time you put the reverse starter here. Okay. Um, the second time you schedule it, you, you st still use the same run button, you the same switch here, this run. You switch the auxiliary contacts to the reverse, same e-stop, same MCRs, um, same overload. <laughs> and so you basically use the I.O., just about all of it, twice by scheduling this twice. Okay. There was my electrical interlock there. You would use the forward. So this code is into this motor control. And so if all these are coming true, then we're going to get true all the way across here. And the motor is going to come on. And let's say the run jog switch was true. When you let up on the run, it would, the motor would come on. But for some reason, if you had the run jog, where's my run jog? If it was false, if this was false, well then you wouldn't have memory. You would just have a momentary uh, motor on, motor off. Okay. So how did you accomplish um, having it go forward or reverse? Well, what you would have is you have the forward reverse switch right here. So the second time that you scheduled this function block for the reverse, you would put a not right here on the second one. So the first one of these is an open contact. The, the second one is a not, so it's a closed contact. So when we bring the forward reverse switch, if it gets a zero or a one, in the first sub, it either makes this true or false. And if it makes this true in the first subroutine, it makes it false in the second subroutine and vice versa. If this is false in the first subroutine, it's true in the second subroutine. So even though both of these are automatically scheduled, the first function block and the second function block that looks very similar to this is automatically scheduled, only one of them is going to have all their ladders true because this forward reverse switch, one's a not, and the other one's just regular, it's open, is going to return only one of the subs is going to be true here and the other one's false, and the other one's false, the other one's true. So if you understand that, you can take a look, but that's what your logic would look like, and you could reuse this function block over and over and over again. So, <coughs> um, we would review um, your homework. You will review the quiz that you took last time. It was about math, and um, typically people understand the Boolean math there. I want to remind you that the in-class worksheet is not a substitute for your knowledge. So even though you're filling out an in-class worksheet, it's your, um, your responsibility to understand what you're adding on to that 
in-class worksheet and you can use it for a study guide but ultimately that don't use it as a crutch the in-class worksheet is what you're supposed to be learning okay <laughs> our topics here are scheduling routines and tags so a PLC software stole, stole, stores the controllers program okay and a CPU can execute only one project at a time so when we start up our, our um, a new project here we start a project and we assign a CPU to it okay and in that project and this is for example on, a, on the Allen Bradley the project file contains tasks programs and routines okay and these are what we use to schedule and so that's what we're doing a lot of scheduling now to be sure that the PLC is doing exactly what we want it to so once again we start the program here's a Siemens we start a project and after this what you would do is you would create a new project and you would add a CPU to it and then the CPU is going to run that one project one project at a time <clears throat> when we get that project created you get a tree structure over here and the tree contains all the functions of this and so some of the things that we've used so far are the main OB that's the main um, ladder we put put our main ladder logic into here our main scheduling into here where we're, we've been scheduling subroutines we have our PLC tags where we've been putting PLC tags um, oh, excuse me right here show all tags so the, the different thing that's going the different things that are going on within the project are listed right here okay and that's the tree IO configuration everything like that <laughs> so in our Siemens organizer here's one that's similar to what we're going to be doing we're going to, here's our PLC, we've generated a project for it, and we're going to put different blocks in here. There's our main, we've used a main, and what this is showing is PLC tags, it says show all tags, and it says PLC tags. So here example would be all of our PLC tags, it would have the addresses, these are my outputs, these are my inputs, and here's some bits here, ends are bits, but that's all found through the tree right here. That's the way the semen org organizes this stuff. <coughs> so when we talk about scheduling, Allen Bradley has the three levels of scheduling, task programs and routines. Siemens has two levels of scheduling, program blocks and routines. So I've got some slides that show a little bit of both. Um, and, but basically we want to understand the difference between the continuous tasks and the periodic tasks. Okay? So, or the program blocks. So some things are scanned continuously. You know the pro the the PLC just starts taking a look at the pro the program block that you've put in there and it just processes that program block and it moves on to the next one and it moves on to the next one in that order and these actually typically have pretty low priority you know it's just going to go and do its job sc uh, scanning those and then there's periodic activities that the PLC does in the per periodic what that does is that interrupts the continuous task so if the continuous is running and something periodic is called it stops scanning in, in many cases your ladder logic to run the periodic tasks logic and then when that's done it comes back to the continuous okay but only one is executed at a time okay so the <laughs> so on our continuous they are um, just pro the, you know the, the first one scan the second one scan the next one scan they just scan 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 and they have the lowest priority and you can give them the priority that by, by putting them in order here so it's going to do this one first this one second this one third this one fourth etc all the way down okay we put our continuous task it's called the main OB in the semen so it's going to be called anything that you put in the main is just going to get automatically scanned we don't need to schedule the main OB anything you put in there gets scanned okay periodic uh, our function is timed interrupts so if for some reason the main OB is running and then we get a periodic task it stops running the main OB it runs the periodic task and then when it's done running the periodic task it goes back to the main OB and then it keeps running from where we left off okay there's event driven where you can have um, like a limit switcher or something like that trigger um, a periodic task so whether it's time driven or event driven what this does is this stops the main OB from running it runs the task that this thing triggered and when that's done 
then the main starts running again, the main OB starts running again. So here we go. We're going to create a program to run a washing machine, and we're going to create the different types of tags. We're going to put in some continuous, some error, some startup, and some continuous. So go ahead and stop and watch that video right there. Okay, now that you got that, you can look that here's some type of the tasks that you might want to use. And you can stop and look at this if you want. You want to fill a tank to its maximum level and then drain. It's continuous. That sounds like just like we're doing something, um, some ladder logic, and, and there you go. Um, maybe you want in a high speed a sensor detects a certain type of a reject when it detects it we divert to the project so maybe you've got a limit switch tied to an event and so what this would do is if that was made it would stop running the continuous task that was maybe doing this stuff and then it would run the event task and get a reject and then after it was rejected it would go back to the continuous okay so these are some examples of periodics tasks here's one read one every 20 seconds that's just on a time it's going to stop your continuous run this and when it and after that it's going to keep going this so every 20 seconds in this case your continuous would stop this would run then back to continuous okay so these are different activities <coughs> okay so we have the main program scheduled first it's, it's going to the way that you put these in here with a block name and number is going to be how these run. So it's going to run main OB, then the next one, then the next one. We put those in there, and it will run in that order. If you want to write programs or, or blocks, in, in your, in, you can unschedule them. Okay, And so that way you just maybe you're uh, generating a change on a machine that you're going to implement later, but you want to have it all done before you implement it. Then you write the program. It's not scheduled so it doesn't do anything and then maybe when it's time for changeover then you just schedule it into there as a continuous and then it gets scheduled so routines are the second level of scheduling within our project here and the routines contain the code so these this is where you're going to see your ladder logic and stuff in the routines okay um, the routine has to be programmed in the same language okay but it can be programmed in a different a variety of different languages, so you can take your pro, yours and you can program them in ladder logic or function block or structured text or sequential function chart. But the entire routine has to be this. So you can have the first routine uh, programmed in FCS and the second routine in ladder and the third routine in function. You just can't have both in the same routine, okay? And then they get scheduled. So once again. There can be the main routine, and that's going to execute continuously. We're going to have a subroutine to the functions in the function blocks, we call them. And these um, need to be scheduled in, out of the main routine. And then you have fault routines. If it finds a fault, you can have a fault routine um, that will interrupt these other routines. So these get scheduled as well. Okay. So here's a, a washing machine routines. So go ahead and um, take a look read this right here and then take a look at this video of creating washing machine routines okay after you've created the routines now we're going to talk about scheduling those routines so go ahead and stop the video here and watch this one okay <laughs> so what we did is we created uh, some routines and we scheduled them in our in our washing machine uh, continuous scan and so let's just take a look at what these might look like so we would have a routine called cycle selection and we had a routine called cycle start and cycle stop so your cycle selection it would it's this is listed first so it's going to run this first it's going to start taking a look at this ladder logic first okay and then after that it it moved to the next one which i think this was about the third one that it was going to run but it, it runs all this first and then it runs this one and then it would move on to the next one etc okay so if you look at this it looks like i've got cycle selects you either do a normal perm press or gentle and those are tied to these outputs here so if for some reason any one of these cycle selects permanent press if any one of these are selected then this goes false because it's right now it's got a zero in there it's closed so i got a true 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 so if any one of these are true then my cycle non-selected is no longer true because we have selected a cycle so then you're going to get these to go off. So these will fall off here once you've selected a cycle. How do you select a cycle? Looks like you got an input here, an input here, or an input here. So once you select this cycle, it looks like 
these are inputs um, that would remain true because this is going to be a push button and then what we do is cycle complete so that that was going to start true and so when we hit when we hit that we are going to get this to come true when we push the push button and what that does is latches itself on and then it's going to go ahead and kill this and so it's going to drop these two out because this is going to go false this one drops out but we had memory first the way that scans so basically this is selecting a cycle it looks like so it's taking the data from this subroutine and that we've got you know general cycle something like this and it's then when it starts scanning this next cycle it is looking to see if some of the stuff from this subroutine gets carried into here notice these are PLC tags located in a subroutine that's fine so here's our cycle selection no cycle so here's it looks like it's got a bit here called no cycle and that gets returned into the cycle start so once again it's going to come through here it's going to see if your lid is closed if you've hit your cycle start you would have had to have selected a cycle right here or else it, would, it just isn't going to go right so once you've got your cycle selected you're good and then um, it just shows some logic here for running this and once again if this cycle is not complete it takes this and it pushes that data back into this one cycle complete l2011 it's being used here so there's some example of how these subroutines are tied together and how they're scheduled and how they're using global tags interchangeably between them if these were local tags then you couldn't you couldn't do this you could if this is a local tag you could not take cycle complete and do cycle complete here because they would be local and the different subroutines wouldn't see each other <laughs> so Siemens use a tag base addressing structure so we've got into this quite a bit so on the slick 500s you create data you know an input you know you'd give an input one slash zero or whatever and then you would make a name for it like push button one okay and then you would get another address and you would give it push button two address push button three whatever Siemens and Allen Bradley control logics are different they you take the tag you you name the item first push button one and then you give it the address okay so in the in the other one what you would do is you would change the the, the name given to an address that doesn't work here because the it's completely opposite that you've got the name and then you've given it to the address okay so everybody just be clear about that everything is running on tags and so for our memory for our um, bits we used um, bits like M00 well you can you have a name that you might call memory bit for example or never true bit something like that that's the tag name and then you assign the bit that you want the M to that same with inputs and outputs I's and Q's scope refers to these so we talked about the program scope to the PLC scope tags <laughs> a lot of these times this is the IO the IO tags but you can have bits that are programmed or PLC scoped okay when you IO tags are automatically created in those PLC scoped tags okay and they're available throughout the program you can you can uh, access them in subroutines and you can access those in cyclical routines and you can access those in continuous main okay um, here's showing a couple of <laughs> um, items here and so this is a, su a sub routine and this is a subroutine and this one has uh, locally scoped tags okay tag 1 tag 2 tag 3 and this program B has tag 1 tag 2 tag 3 these have the same tag name because in a subroutine subroutine A cannot see what subroutine B is doing okay that's why there's an arrow here with a cross with a line through it so you can reuse the tag name multiple times but the PLC tag is this is the sensor or the temperature these are hooked to inputs these are actually connected to inputs or associated with inputs so I can take this sensor one and I can use it in program A and I can take sensor one and I can use it here but I can't have more than one sensor one because there's only one sensor actually hooked to that item there 
So once again, be aware these tags cannot be shared with, this, with these subroutines or it cannot be shared with the main. <coughs> An alias tag is when you're creating a name for the IO. So that's what I was talking about where you come up with a tag name fan motor and then what you do is you give fan motor an address okay and that's the alias fan motor is the alias for the address it's backwards and it's like 500s where you take the address and then you give it a name here you have a name and you give it an address okay and that is called an alias it's easy to remember fan motor instead of you know that the second slot I'll put on the fifth bit it's a lot easier to remember fan motor than this so PLCs use 16 and 32-bit operations so what we've been using right now is boolean a lot because we're either turning something on or off the input is either 0 or 1 okay and we talked about this a little bit earlier at the bit level that we're only using um, a single bit here one or zero, high or low, true or false. Data types on these PLCs were actually returning numbers like um, when we were doing counter presets and accumulations. Well then we were using integers here and so we were actually putting in um, registers or files and the series of ones and zeros here returns uh, a binary number um, maybe 300 or 200 or 100 or whatever we were using. Boolean is 0 or 1. So here's the different ones. Uh, SINT has 8 bits. An integer has 16 bits. A double integer or a double word is 32 bits. And then a real is used for analog where you actually can get, you know, 3.06 times 10 to the fourth power. You know, some, some really exact numbers, real numbers here. And so these are the different data types that you might assign when you're creating your tags. But, but for us, we've been using primarily Boolean because we're just looking at things coming on or off. So he, here's an example of what the Boolean is, zero ones, assign integers because they're eight bits. If you do your um, binary math, you get values of uh, negative 128 to 127. Integers, 16 bits, combinations of ones and zeros. Um, if you do your binary math, you get negative 32,000 to 32,000. Double integer, you get a pretty big 2 billion there. In real, use floating point arithmetic to get the exact very large number. Okay, So that's it. You have a quiz and then you have a lab on scheduling.